Buenas tardes. Disculpad, pero voy a hablar en inglés porque es el, el idioma de trabajo del, del Congreso en el que se enmarca esta conferencia. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Olivia Orozco. I'm coordinating the Education and Economic Program here in Casa Árabe. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce our guest lecture this afternoon on uh, writing in languages, notes about displacement by Lina Meruane, Chilean uh, writer and teacher of Palestinian origin. In her lecture, Lina Meruane is going to reflect on the challenges of narrating different um, journeys through the Arab world in her native language of Spanish. She will be discussing the loss and recovery of Arabic among the diaspora and the limits of um, interacting and writing between foreign languages. Uh, Spanish, German, Greek, uh, French and Arabic that uh, at the end resort to, by default to English as we are doing today as, as the language for uh, working language for or diplomacy and war as, as she puts it. So she's going to speak um, about what is lost and what is gained in, by writing in, in these different languages. And if I understood well, she's going to speak about uh, those spaces and situations created between what can be translated and what cannot be translated, what, what is understood and what is not understood in, that, in those processes of, of language transitions. And more about how can we turn these limitations into an opportunity for creativity, which is the, the subject of, of the conference these, these days. And this afternoon, we had an amazing um, moment in one of the sessions of the, of the conference, discussing about um, writing poetry with Mary Jane uh, Holmes, who spoke about the Muwasaha, which is a form of poetry developing in the, during the Andalusian period, and how the forms of poetry can be a source of creativity because of the kind of, if I understood well, it's because of the limits and obstacles that the, the structure puts on, then you have to adapt and, and that really develops um, a whole process of creativity. And in the same way, uh, we were discussing about, about this, as I said, about writing poetry, but also about teaching languages, um, in this case, uh, French and Arabic. Uh, by mixing and using also uh, different languages and doing also this transition between languages. Because both the poets that, um, that uh, wrote the Muwasahas and our teachers uh, of Arabic use different registers of the language between the standard of the, or the educated language and the colloquial or the dialect. And, and, and our teach uh, with the students also of multicultural uh, backgrounds where other languages come into the play and this enriches also the whole process and experience of learning the, um, and writing the, the language and is indeed also a source of, of creativity. The lecture today is one of Casa Arabe's contribution to this to this six um, international teaching congress of the European Association of Creative Writing Programs, which we are hosting these days. And for Casa Arabe, in, in addition to an exercise of resistance, as, as our director uh, framed it in the opening, it's also an opportunity to, to contribute, to introduce Arabic language in the, in the conference, um, writing Arabic and uh, speaking about Arabian, Ar Arab writers in the, um, introducing them in the discussion. Arabic is indeed a language which is uh, spoken uh, by more than 300 million people in the world from North Africa to, to the Middle East. And it's also the official language of, of 26 countries, including the, the United Nations. This makes it the fifth most widely spoken uh, language in the world after English, Mandarin, Hindi, and Spanish, and ahead of French, if dialects are included. And, and moreover, I, I would like to highlight that um, Arabic is a language, or we like to highlight also in our activities that Arabic is a language that is spoken, studied, and, and also written in, in Europe. So here in Casara, we have the Arabic Language Center, uh, where we have 12 native teachers of Arabic from different countries of the world, 
and we have more than 400 students every term learning Arabic in the different forms, so standard and dialects. And also we have children, as you are going to see tomorrow, because I probably you saw some classes these days of Arabic, but tomorrow we will have the house full of, of children and adults also uh, learning Arabic uh, here. So a group of, of students of the center, oh, sorry, a group of, of teachers of the center that have been following a course by the um, Escuela de, de Traductores are trying um, a course on creative writing, are trying to introduce the tools and methods of, of creative writing also in our classes, in our method for, for learning uh, Arabic. So, and this is also one of the, they also participated in, in one of the workshop that we have, they have um, today. And this has been an interesting experience to enrich the, the, the learning uh, and writing of Arabic of our students. So in this way, and especially thanks to Lina Meruane's lecture today, we are going to, we're very happy to contribute um, to incorporate elements of, of Arabic writing and literature in this, in this uh, conference, for I think it's the first time uh, we have Arabic, also there were some uh, workshops and uh, communications on the issue. And I would really like to thank um, Lina Meruane for accepting to participate here because I know she has been very busy, has been very difficult to, to put this in her schedule. She presented her last book yesterday, uh, Palestina and Pedazos, who we will be also presenting it on the 31st of May. And uh, thanks a lot, Lina, for being here. Let me introduce her briefly. Uh, Lina Meruane is a Chilean, Chilean writer and educator of Palestinian origin. She has been a professor at New York uh, university since 2011, and uh, now she's currently teaching uh, at, um, at its Madrid campus. Her fiction books include the stories brought together in Las Infantas and Navidad and five novels, Postuma, Cercada, Fruta Podrida, Sangre en el Ojo, and Sistema Nervioso, uh, which have been translated into 12 languages. Her non-fiction books include the uh, essays Viajes Virales, Viral Journeys, and Zona Ciega, Blind Spot, as well as the personal essay Palestina in Pedazos, Palestine in Pieces, which is an expanded version of her prior, uh, prior work, Volverse Palestina, Becoming Palestine. As I said, will be presented on the 31st of May here in Casa Arabe. And, and also the lyrical essay Palestina, for example, Palestine, Palestine for instance, and Contra los Hijos Against Children. So she has received uh, many awards, including the Blue Metropolis, uh, Canada 2023, she, she was just recently there receiving it, Calamo in Spain 2016, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, Mexico 2012, Anna Seger, Segers, Germany 2011, and writing grants from the Gunga High Foundation, the NEA, the DAT, and Casa Cien Años de Soledad, and one others. So thanks a lot, Lina, for being here, and, and the first yours. Um, se escucha, verdad? Sí. You're taller than I am. Eh, well, good evening, everybody. Estoy muy feliz de tener la oportunidad de hablar hoy ante ustedes y con ustedes en esta casa árabe de Madrid. Gracias a Irene Lozano, Karim Hauser y a Olivia Orozco. Gracias por esas palabras tan generosas. Y asimismo a Andrés Sagarna y bueno, ya todos ustedes por estar aquí. Eh, my talk will be uh, will be mostly in Spanish. And uh, I apologize for the limitations of my written and spoken English. I don't know how many uh, native English speakers are actually here. So this talk is called Writing in Tongues. And it has a very short epigraph by the US writer, the late US writer Lucia Berlin, who actually lived also in Chile and Mexico. And I really love this sentence uh, in, in one of her books. I keep trying to remember who I was in English. I will refer to that later. Once upon a time, 20 years ago to be precise, the late Argentinian writer and scholar Silvia Molloy critically examined the so-called foreignness of foreign languages. What effects might it have, she said, she said, she spoke, as the event was no less than the inaugural address to the Modern Languages Association yearly conference. 
She said, what effect might it have, she asked uh, her multilingual audience, to push both monolinguism and bilingual exchanges even further. Molloy wondered if it would be possible to begin and perhaps give her entire talk in this way. Ladies and Monsieur, dear friends and colleagues. And she pondered provocatively whether she might discard the italics in foreign words, that is, in non English words, in order to give them all equal weight in usage. Because who is to say, she said, where lies the foreign? This question fascinates me. But let me stay with her first few lines. The idea of beginning her address with ladies and monsieur and colleagues, all in one line, in the expectation of being understood without translation, or even without that expectation, simply to push monolingualism and bilingual practices further. Molloy, who at the time of her address was fluent in and even wrote in three European languages, Spanish, English, French, would, would try her hand in a literary essay entitled Vivir entre lenguas, Living Between Languages, is my unsuccessful translation. But against her own suggestion of writing in several tongues, she did not go too far in language switching. Instead, she chose to examine, in Spanish mostly, the complexities of her linguistic autobiography. She learned first to speak in the local Spanish, then to read in her father's English, and later spent years trying to recover the French her mother had lost in migration. Molloy also explores in this brief, beautiful essay, the losses and findings in multilingual verbal exchanges throughout her life, as well as the challenges of writing in a language that, rather than belonging to those who write, has been lent for the occasion. Molloy does not go so far, as I said, but she does push language further than writers many of you who have written mostly or solely in a Lent language without allowing the other one to appear in their texts. Take, for instance, the Irish Samuel Beckett's decision to write his later work in French in order to impoverish his language. He himself would trans translate it back into English. One might think of this decision as a merely aesthetic choice, although there is probably more to it. In any case, Beckett seems less of a Beckett's seems less of a survival strategy than that of the Hungarian novelist Agota Christophe's switch to French after she escaped to Switzerland. She would describe this linguistic switch as imposition in la l'analphabet, the illiterate or l'analfabeta in a work as brief and fragmentary as Molloy's. What matters to me is her assertion, Christophe's assertion, that she had written her books in the enforced language of exile, in an enemy language that was suffocating her own. And in fact, there are no Hungarian words in her essay. Let me add, though, that the impoverished enemy tongue in which she will write her novels serves Christophe beautifully in Le Gran Cayer, the notebook El Gran Cuaderno, where two precarious twins teach themselves to read and write with a dictionary, much as she did herself while working at a Swiss factory. Kata, Katia, Katia Petroskaya, a Jewish contemporary author born in Kiev, Ukraine, who writes in German, also calls her liter literary tongue an enemy one for different reasons, reasons that have to do with Nazism and the Holocaust, of course. But I thought it was interesting to note that the notion of writing in an enemy language um, is very present here and is still very present also in Latin America, where uh, writers of indigenous descent feel that they are still writing in the 
they are now writing in the enemy language, the language of colonialism. Um, Cristina Rivera Garza, the Mexican writer, commented that she wrote in the enemy language, but she wrote against the enemy in that language. All of these things I find really interesting, very political, of course. Many contemporary writers have done the same, switch entirely to the second language in their literary writing. Yugoslavian-born Alexander Hemon and Mexican-American Valeria Luiselli, just to mention two examples, have followed the linguistic steps of Russian-American novelist uh, Nabokov, who also taught himself his sophisticated literary English from dictionaries, Polish-British novelist Joseph Conrad, who pompously affirmed to have been chosen by English and, um, and written, um, sorry, there's a little typo here. Uh, Hemon and Luiselli uh, have written their most uh, recent books in a supple rather than impoverished English. None of the aforementioned texts and authors seem to push monolingualism nor bilingualism too far. Not far enough, Molloy would certainly contend. Not far enough for me either, but I will refer to my own linguistic choices later. These texts, let me insist, do not push monolingualism nor bilingualism far. They do not make of language protagonic. This is false translation. They do not seem to trust that readers will be able to figure the other language out or even stop trying to and just get on with it without being lost in tongues. One, might lear one may learn something when reading in tongues. I have certainly pushed myself further when not understanding. Y solo para darle un ejemplo a los hispanohablantes, me parece muy interesante el hecho de que yo leí casi todos mis libros en traducción, traducidos desde la lengua española de España o desde la lengua argentina, el español argentino. Y aprendí muchísimo leyendo todas estas palabras que no conocía, pero que pude entender. Lo mismo pasa con las lenguas en traducción. But let me return to the foreign. But where does the foreign lie, would ask Molloy. Were she here, were she alive? The foreign is, in this case, in the case of Hemon or the case of Valeria Luiselli, not Anglo-Saxon. Allow me then to return to the foreign but monolingual writers in English. Let me suggest that by hiding the other language, their texts will not remind readers of what is experienced and spoken by their protagonists, who are said so often to be foreigners in the scene. It is precisely this coexistence of languages, this being between languages, or this living between languages, in stories of foreigners and migrants and their descendants, what was made visible by Dominican-American novelist Juno Diaz in his early Drown, 1996, and his later The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wao, 2007, and in some of Peruvian-American uh, author Daniel Alarcón's work. Alarcón, by the way, ha trabajado la crónica en español en su célebre podcast Radio Ambulante, que recomiendo mucho. Going much further in the likes of Molloy, Ecuadorian-American Mauro Javier Cárdenas wrote and importantly kept entire pages in Spanish without translation within the revolutionaries try again of 2016. And Argentinian-American Mariana Graciano goes equally far in Pasajes, 2017, a novelle of intercultural love set in Brooklyn. It is my contention here that the latter writers are no longer abandoning the tongues of their upbringing, no longer going beyond or against them. They are not using one tongue to impoverish the other, to silence and deny the other, to submit their own or their family's own to the colonial or dominant or richer language they live in. Rather than seeing languages as enemies or as traitors, they are putting them, the languages, in dialogue with each other. 
as if languages like peoples had to learn to live together. Once upon, so this is number two. Once upon a time, Molloy lucidly suggested, I don't remember in which of her many inspiring works, that rather than think of languages as points of arrival, they should be conceived as points of departure. Languages as starting points that drive us into the unknown. Languages that force us to consider who one is, who we are, when we are in a language or two, who we were in the past in a language or languages, even when we are unable to remember it. And perhaps this is the point where I should turn to my own linguistic explorations, meanderings and deviations within tongues. I, as Lucia Berlin enigmatically says, I do not remember who I was in English as I was growing up in the US, as I learned to read and write in English in the US and forgot my Spanish or better, or better said and put my infant intimate Spanish on hold for a couple of years until we returned to Chile. I also do not know who I would have become had Arabic not been lost in my family much before my birth. That is, much after my grandparents moved from Palestine to Chile in the early 20th century, much after they married in the 1930s, after they multiplied following as Christians that they were the Bible's mandate, and after they stopped speaking in Arabic to their children, my father, my four aunts, so they could fully assimilate into Chilean-ness. The loss of Arabic is thus one of the departing points of my book, Volverse Palestina or Becoming Palestine, a book which used to have two parts, but was recently expanded and re-edited with a new title, Palestina en pedazos or in pieces, as um, uh, Olivia said. Palestina en pedazos is a fragmentary book which, briefly said, moves between and across genres, combining bits and pieces of autobiography and family memories of migration into Chile, the story of the large Chilestinian community and their linguistic losses, my return to Palestine in the place of my grandparents and my father, my travels through the occupied territories, as well as through many worldly cities and towns that intersect with my trip, and my reflections on the political role of language in contexts of conflict. I began writing this book in a rather desperate situation, in the flight to Palestine to be precise, without thinking of my choice of writing in Spanish. But what other tongue would I have written in? This is a question I have struggled with over the years. Should I have learned Arabic to work in the tongue of the land I was returning to, even if the entire trip had been filtered by me in Spanish? Should I have written in English the language in which I communicated there and continue to use everywhere while traveling? The writing came mostly in my language, a language of comfort, but not of contact. But soon enough, this monolingual, contented approach was interrupted by the presence of words and phrases in which so many exchanges actually occurred, English. I instinctively let in the international language of diplomacy and war that English is. For better and worse, the world I was trying to convey was interspersed with that tongue, was dominated by it. But was it? And was it only? I had already written and published the first two parts of my book, but asked myself why I was not paying any heed to the other languages that were also present in my interactions and in the background of the text. Hebrew, German, French, Italian, Greek, Wolof, Portuguese. 
and why I was not considering that there was also the languages of the land, the lost language I did not understand and thus I was denying in my text. As I wrote on, I realized I needed to listen carefully and learn to distinguish Arabic in the Babelian landscape I was moving in and out of, in airports and checkpoints, in museums and buses, in borders and coffee shops, within Palestine and without. I needed to learn and acknowledge its musicality, its words, which Spanish, as you know, is full of after the eight centuries of Muslim conquest in this very peninsula. Think of the onomatopoeic Algarabia that is translated as the onomatopoeic Hulabalu, or the military Alferes, or the delicious Alcachofa, which is also Alcausil, or the hopeful Ojala, which derives from Inshallah, God willing, or Allah willing. If I was being in the world, being between and somewhat beyond languages, as Molloy posits it, the multiplicity of languages would destabilize the hierarchies of power put into the text by the choice of languages. Languages needed to multiply in my text in order to mirror local realities while defying colonial realizations. And yes, there was in that choice, there still is, discomfort. Uh, discomfort in the unintelligible, the opaque, the untranslatable. But there was, there still is, the revelation, the defiance, the joy of recovering the language that has been lost, of introducing the lang of reintroducing the language of the ilabad, elebad, albalad, without italics, the living language of the land. Yes, there was joy when I transliterated Arabic into the Roman alphabet, and then when I used the striking Arabic script in the last lines of my writing. I would want to show just an image of those last lines. If, si me puedes por favor poner la imagen. ¿Habrá alguien ahí? <laughs> Anybody home? I don't know if you can see it, but this is the, the ending, the ending pages of the text where I really went as far as perhaps my uh, dear Sylvia Molloy would have liked, where uh, in the reading of the beginning of the text itself, of the book itself, uh, the reading goes with other people and it's sort of all the languages that I know of or I, that I know are included just to end with the transliteration and then the writing in Arabic um, alphabet. I think we can talk more about these choices if you like in the in the Q&A. So I will leave it there and thank you very much. Pues si os parece, cogemos algunas preguntas. If you find okay, we can take some questions from the public. In English or Spanish or more? More. <laughs> so we leave the floor open for you. If you want to comment on hair amazing or uh, dimension. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting. You can take that. Sorry. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I learned a lot. Um, recognized some names and some new names to investigate. Thank you. Um, one of the things that strikes me, obviously, I'm a native English speaker and uh, uh, with some poor French, but uh, obviously coming here always makes me think, reflect on the ability of everybody or most people here to speak multiple languages. But I know, for instance, in my own teaching, um, we spend some time recognizing and acknowledge that English itself, there are Englishes, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about that, because one of the things I think it's been really exciting in fiction 
English fiction, um, in American fiction, but I'm speaking as a British writer, for instance, um, uh, you know, I'm actually reading uh, Bundine Evaristo at the moment, and uh, Evaristo uses a lot of what's called pidgin English, you know, Caribbean English. Um, and of course, a lot of young people, um, I'm sure it's the same in Spanish and other, Engl other languages, use, uh, vernac you know, sort of vernacular slang, and these become, what's the word, kind of move into the dominant English or the dominant language. I just wondered, I just am quite interested because obviously I recognize the idea of English in the way that you, <laughs> you rightly pointed out that Conrad talks about it and, Nab you know, and, and, and Nabokov and, and these people who talk about English finding them, this grand, you know, the language of war and diplomacy. But I'm also very well that I think there's never been more true where English um, has become more malleable in some way. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that, or if there are correspondences in some of the languages that you've talked about. Well, thank you very much for that question. It is true that I might have reduced English to two forms of English, British and uh, the US English, as if, if, as if there were stable, rigid uh, forms. Um, I myself know this because I, was, I, I first learned English in New Jersey, then uh, relearned English in a British school and uh, have lived in the United States for 20 years uh, in New York, which is its own English interspeared with Spanglish and all sorts of Chinglish, you know, all, all sorts of mixes. So, so yes, it is true that uh, no language is a rigid language. My, my sort of my concern or my interest is in a, in a in the development of a certain sensibility which i think is happening in all languages of recognizing and incorporating sort of the spoken the spoken language and sort of the oral right and so i i suddenly find that texts that no longer recognize those ways of speaking and those other languages that surround us or live in us um, is, is kind of strange. It's kind of disconnected with the real world. And I'm not saying that novels have to imitate the real world, but I'm just finding it that there's something happening in the writing that is becoming more malleable. Uh, even in very strict languages, literary languages such as Arabic, which for a very, very long time has really not included much of the oral uh, and is very strict in the form, in the structure even. Uh, I hear from my uh, Arabic speaking friends and translators that that has also been questioned. And that questioning usually comes first from poetry. There's something about poetry which is much more, it's freer, right? It's more um, experimental. Also because, at least, well, this also happens in the Spanish-speaking world, when you find really innovative things coming from poetry, and it's perhaps because poets have the freedom because they don't earn from their poetry, mostly. While novelists have to really pay attention to the copy editors, who are the strictest people that I've never, ever known. Uh, but I do see that, and I wanted just to give another example. For example, here in Spain, for Latin American writers, and I'll come back to English in a second, uh, for Latin American writers, it used to be the case that our books, our language, our, our use of words, not, not even jargon, but just regular words coming from Chilean, Spanish, Argentinian language, Venezuelan language, and so on, would be translated into the Spanish of Spain in the belief that the reader would abandon the book because he or she would be lost. Uh, that was called something like localización lingüística. And there were, there were experts who would read and change all the words uh, as there was a need of translation within Spanish, right? And I think that that's sort of very rigid and was happening a lot with novels. So then the interesting thing is when those books were actually published in Spain and then imported back into Latin America and one would read a Chilean writer doing things that were completely odd in a Spanish that didn't really belong, right? And that is actually has, I feel that that pressure 
from, from my friends within and without the industry has ceased to be the case. It's no longer well seen. It's pretty much resisted by, by writers. And I think also even in Spain, uh, the sort of the, the bad writing of bad Spanish is being celebrated, most recently by a writer called Sabina Urraca, who is the editor of a small publishing house within a larger publishing house, which is Penguin Random House, who has made a point of sort of incorporating books that are written in, um, in, the, in the accent or in the ways of the Canarian Islands, let's say. Right? And so that is actually happening here. I, I'm just trying to illustrate this sense of a more malleable language, which is more open and acceptable. And that brings me back to the question of English, where I'm sure this is what you're describing, I can imagine, is something that is more recent. Uh, I don't know. I'm not an expert in the English language. And though I do read English, I wouldn't be able to figure out what's odd and what's not. I would just read it as English because I don't have such linguistic capacity in English. But, I, but I'm sort of wondering, and I think it would, would be interesting to, to know whether this is happening recently, because that would sort of confirm that something is happening. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you. At the risk of sounding like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, I, I'm a writer from Italy who writes in English. <laughs> um, and I've lived in the UK since um, I moved there when I was 19. It's a weird time, because you get your whole childhood in a monolingual environment and then you move somewhere else and take on this as your professional, well not straight away, but your, your, your professional, the, 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 not even professional, like the creative language that you produce with creative agency. In. Um, and I moved to the UK in 2007 um, with a mind to sort of um, use English as a way, a la Beckett, but in the sense that for me, um, English was like um, a way to access a level of rigor in my writing because the Italian syntax is very capacious, like the Spanish syntax, I think. Um, and so it was a way to really kind of think about selection and economy. Now in, the, in 2010, um, Britain, I can't vote there still. <laughs> Um, elected the Conservative government, which we kept on. And so my relationship with the language I was really excited about, um, both because I grew up, and that's over 15 years ago, and because my practice evolved and the political circumstances I was surrounded by changed, has changed. And I was curious to know um, if that is something that you experience in relation to sort of your ongoing and evolving practice, if that relationship with the different languages that sort of make you has shifted in a, in a similar way depending on kind of placement and circumstance. Sorry, repeat the last part, because um, I kind of lost. Um, I was just curious to know if you felt that your relationship with the multiple languages that you speak and use in your work has evolved and changed as a result of a shift in landscape and perhaps shift in circumstances mm -hmm. in terms of where you lived and practiced. No, no, absolutely, of course, because one, one, is, one feeds all the time from the experience one lives, right? This is why I was kind of think that it's surprising that sometimes this does not really feed into the writing itself. Uh, not as a criticism, it's just sort of um, a little strange to me. Not that, you know, I think anybody needs to make their own choices for whatever reason. So it's not a sort of a critical in that way. But I do feel that in my own experience, in my own writing in Spanish, it has been contaminated, and I really like this word, contaminated by the languages that I have learned throughout, and especially by English, uh, in ways that feel inadequate sometimes in Spanish itself. I mean, one of the things that I found in 2012, I, I sent an essay uh, to be edited in, in Mexico by a really small publisher, and the copy editor came back and said, um, your Spanish sounds uh, influenced by English. You use too many, ¿cómo se dice esto? Gerundios. Uh, no sé lo que son los uh, the ing verbs yeah the ing verbs right yeah so i use the ing verbs so freely and i find them so elastic i i love this this tense right and so the copy editor had changed every single one of them right and and also another friend with my previous novel uh, sangre en el ojo seeing red also insisted that there was this english thing going on with my book and i said yes of course I've been in the United States for 20 years. 
uh, my language has been impacted by the contact with the other language. So while I do not regularly use Spanglish in the way we understand Spanglish, like a Dominican or Puerto Rican kind of way of speaking, uh, I do have incorporated ways of the English language. And I think also when I write in English, I still have the, those very long paragraphs, all these commas, right, which copy editors in the United States would probably want to you know, break up with uh, full stops. So, but I when when but going back to the copy the Mexican copy editor who was so concerned about my Spanish, I just had to tell her that I had to undo her corrections because this is the way not only that I write but that I think. So my thinking has also been permeated by this other language, and I'm sure that if. You know, I went to Japan at some point, something about the Japanese language, if I learned it and used it frequently, uh, I don't really write in English much. I mean, I wrote now in English, but I, my, my literature is written always in Spanish, but still it carries the weight of English and it would carry the weight of, I don't know, Japanese. And if I lived in Argentina, I would probably start picking up Argentinian words, which are sometimes quite different to Chilean words or mean different things. So, and I, and I kind of find that interesting. I, I really like that. I don't want the writing to be um, homogenized in a sort of standard way. I don't like these, like, I don't like that. I don't like um, omniscient narrators that don't seem to be anywhere. I, I really like it when, when I kind of can feel something that is happening there uh, different. And the language is very, very important to me. Not the correctness. Well, I, I'm just going to be thinking aloud, but uh, uh, so the direction that my thinking wants to take is uh, the gender discourse, perhaps. And now, um, what about what if we consider, let's say, English in this case, the language of refuge? What if a person wants to abandon her old language because it is connected with, let's say, well, some, some sort of abuse uh, and finds uh, English a safe haven? Uh, now, this is one, perhaps one question or one half of a question. The second half of a question would be, we live in uh, gendered languages. Polish is a gendered language, Russian is a gendered language. Wait, wait, wait. What, what's the last Polish, yes. Russian, uh, German, obviously, French is a, uh, a gendered language, Spanish, same. English offers a genderless space in which one can function without thinking about whether she is female or male or something else. And so, uh, and objects around her also don't have necessarily to be gendered. We don't have to think, oh, la voiture. Oh, no, is it le, is it la? Uh, so, yeah, that's my question. Okay. So, uh, let's see what the, f oh, the first question was again, just quickly. Do we have to think about English oh, as, as like a safe co haven. colonizing language or a safe haven? Rather? Well, I, I am sure we can. I mean, why not? I mean, English, I mean, any language can be a language, an enemy language or a, friend, a friendly language, depending on how we relate to it. Right. And so I was interested in, for example, the fact that these two writers that I mentioned, Christoph and Petroskaya, see the language that they write in, which I find super interesting to write in a language which you feel is suffocating. And in fact, Christoph is killing her own language as she has turned to this language, which is useful to her, which brings, which pays the checks, so to speak. Right, but still is an enemy language because she was forced to convert into it. And with Petroskaya, it's also a really interesting idea, right, that the German language is an enemy language to her Jewishness, right, but she is still using it. And this is why I wanted to include Rivera Garza's comment that yes, she uses the language of the enemy, the Spanish colonial language imposed in Latin America centuries ago, but it is to criticize or to, to you know, uh, put in tension that language and that culture. So, I mean, there's so many ways to relate 
to the language that we use and that we live in or the languages that we use and we live in. Of course, these are really personal choices. And what I'm trying to, I was trying to think about was to see sort of the diversity of choices and how people actually relate and think about their own creative writing, which is sort of the question of this conference, right? Because this is a conference on creative uh, writing and language is our material. So how do we relate to that material? What, what do we do with it and why? Right. And so all of these things, I think, are, are there, there's no rule. There shouldn't be a rule in the ways that we think of and use uh, our languages. And then on the question of, of gender. That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, the Spanish verbs include always identify always. And what I am finding very, very interesting in this time of inclusive language. First of all, I've, I've, it's made very obvious to me that, in fact, the universal, el masculino universal, sorry, I never speak of these things in English and then I don't know the words. El masculino universal, the sort of mass, hmm? uh, the gender neutrality. Um, se me fue la onda. Um, espera. Ah, the, so trying to be gender neutral in Spanish. No, wait, I was saying something different. I was trying to say that I have discovered by using the feminine or even the feminine all the time, it, as if I spoke to you as if you all were, were female, right? I have found that super interesting because it has put a lot of tension and it has made me realize that the, there is falseness in the universal masculine, right? And when we turn it around, we see it. So the question of inclusive language has really forced us to see how language was operating in a sort of um, default way where we didn't think so much about it. We did sometimes, but we continue to use it. So what that has meant is that trying to rethink that sort of universality of the masculine you know, pronouns as if we were all male here has really forced creativity in writing. So how do you avoid using the masculine? And what, do you, what twists and turns with language do you need to produce to make it neutral or to just turn it around completely and do something new with language? Very aware of that problem. And so I, I have found it, I mean, some people are really stressed about this and are hateful of the uh, lenguaje inclusivo, right? But I actually find there's an opportunity there, and maybe it's because I myself have always feel very excited about the, that project that was called El Olipo, uh, which was the, the French writers, including uh, Georges Perec and uh, Italo Calvino and so on, uh, Raymond Queneau, who decided to write with lots of limits, a little bit like the dogma group of film that put a lot of limitations. And these limitations, rather than limit the work, actually force the artists to do something fresh and new and think differently, write differently, uh, think about all sorts of strategies to move on with their limits. And that sort of enforced that corset, right? I think does something to your own mind. And so lenguaje inclusivo does something to me when I write, when I think about it. And not always am I comfortable because of course, changing the ways in which we speak and we address others makes us uncomfortable. It's like telling you, you can't dress in a certain way, right? So you're like, why not? I've always dressed in the same way. Well, this is what happens with language and a lot of people resist it, but we can think of it as more creative, as a, more, as a creative tool as well. And, and of course, recognize that we do struggle with it. Just to give you a really small example, and then going to the trans question, I was teaching the other day a, um, a text that was written by La Monja Alferes, uh, Catalina, so-called Catalina de Rauso, born Catalina de Rauso. She was put into a convent. This is a Spanish woman from the Basque country. She was put into a, con a convent. At the age of 15, she runs away, cuts her hair, uh, gets rid of her breasts somehow, dresses like a man and goes all the way south into the Americas and, and, and fights the Mapuche indigenous peoples in Chile. 
She is a very extraordinary figure, and I hear I just made a mistake. He is a very extraordinary figure because he decides not only to take masculine names and a masculine identity um, and a masculine life, but once he's figured out, he's, he goes back to Spain and he gets permission from the Spanish king and the Pope Urbano VII, creo que era, to return to the Americas as a man and uh, not be bothered for being, not, not be questioned. Extraordinary. This is, this is the, the, the period of sort of the early Renaissance. Now, my students were struggling with how to name this person. And they would sort of like, so they would say, yeah, because she, and somebody would say, he, oh yeah, right. And we really discussed the question of how they were uncomfortable, um, confused, uh, and I said, well, yeah, we're going to make mistakes here because we are used to calling a person who has been born as a woman, a woman. But if this person has decided or discovered that he is not that, are we going to respect that choice? And literature and the rewritings of this text and the critics have not respected that at all until now. And so this was a really interesting conversation. What do we do when we are sort of put into that situation where we need to decide what pronoun we're going to use? Yeah. I was going to add something. I'm going yeah, to use yeah, the sure. micro. <laughs> now, because we were talking about this idea of limit, I mean, just to connect with the idea of creativity, uh, because we were speaking in the workshop about how limits and how the limits sometimes uh, promote creativity than, yeah. uh, than otherwise. Now, it happened with the poetry that when you have to, to adapt to certain form or certain structure, you have to use your imagination and to adapt, and then you have to look for other resources, and that, that's that um, that enhance your creativity. So in that sense, um, when you, sp you speak or you use different language, do you find different limitations in every languages? Or how do you feel, uh, how do you work with those limitations and if that enhance your creativity in that sense? Yes. You know, sometimes I'm writing in Spanish and I think of the perfect expression in English. Right, and then that perfect expression in English doesn't translate well at all into Spanish. Uh, but I do more and more think about, for example, when I put a title to my book, I think about, oh, how would this be in English? And I'm sort of sometimes sort of considering both languages at the same time, not in the midst of novel writing, but sometimes when I stop to think about something that is not coming, coming up, it sometimes comes up in English. And so that's a, it, it's kind of interesting to, to think about that. It's because, oh, as I was saying before, I'm, mm, estoy habitada por el inglés también. So uh, being inhabited by the other language a little bit. Um, I also find it's hard to, to answer the question because one is not in full control of what one is doing when one is writing. Um, I do find, for example, that when I write in English, the writing comes out a little differently. Some people say that when you speak in Spanish and you speak in English, your voice comes out a little differently, like the tone of voice. Well, something of the same sort happens also when you try to write in English rather than write directly in English rather than write in Spanish. And I feel that there's something that happens there and I'm not sure what. I actually feel that there's like a, a different tone coming in an English tone, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can answer your question about how it induces creativity. I, I, I do know that I have become more playful with English, Spanish and other languages. And I've found, sort of struggled with how to, to address that. For example, when I was now in Montreal, I received a, a, a literary prize. The languages of that festival were Spanish, English and French. I don't really speak French or much French. I understand a little. And so I gave the talk in two languages, but I did not translate. And somehow people said that they found that the English and the Spanish, even while not translated, worked each on its own way. But of course I had to think when in English, when in Spanish, how's the rhythm, how does the rhythm connect these two languages? And, and these are things that I think about all the time, what to do with the other language, how to work with it, how to make it literary, how to make it creative, when to decide not to use it. So um, I love that challenge, actually. 
yeah i think it's a um it, it's like the muscle is very alive uh, thinking in, in in two languages and then there's something else that i wanted to add that there is a novel that i wrote it's called sistema nervioso nervous system and i worked really hard with the translator because there were parts of the text that didn't make sense but didn't make sense in spanish either it's moments when the protagonist has like a a wild thought and then there's several words one after the other that are sort of in the same semantic uh, world but don't make sense with each other and then one of them is actually not in that in that sort of level and so it's hard it's i'm sorry i cannot give you an example because i won't remember any right now but then the translator was really complicated because i said no don't translate these words literally because the rhythm is going to be lost because a short word in Spanish can be a very long word in English and so on. So I said, keep the rhythm and keep the idea and just do whatever you can with English. And we had so much fun because we would sit down and we, it's like, it was like, okay, what do you think of this? I'm like, oh, what do you think of this? And then eventually it wasn't too close necessarily to the original, but it worked in the same way. So I really liked, I really like working with this translator. She's a really, she has really good literary English and she's very playful. And so we could sort of, she was very um, precise with the rest of the novel, but then at the same time, she was very free kind of translating poetry, but even with very much poetic license. It's like the Mwasaha that you try to write in English. So yeah. Hi. Okay, no. Um, what I found very fascinating about your talk was basically um, that it is pointing out a crisis, a language crisis that I think it's common to many languages uh, in the world because of globalization, because of migration. I'm myself Venezuelan living in Spain with Latvian background and we're moving all around and in this world that border fluidity is you know more frequent and and it's happening more and more so um maybe anticipating to a talk of panel discussion we have tomorrow I, I find really fascinated the way you are addressing this crisis creatively and how your work is responding to that um regarding the page that it was projected before my question is how would you address uh, how readable would be your work? Uh, I thought, you know, saving distances uh, about the finance wake, for example. And how are you interested in real communication or if this kind of dialogue between or among languages is more a poetic and a political gesture? Thank you so much for, for, for that question, coming back to, to the book. Um, it's very far from Finnegan's Wake. It's actually, the book is a very readable book, um, uh, or, or so I am told, I hope. Um, so what, what happens is that, I, let me give a little bit more context. So one of the worries that I had with this book that I've written throughout 10 years is that it starts with losses, you know, the loss of home or homes, the loss of language, uh, the loss of people, right? The losses of, of the migrants and also of the ones who stayed back in Palestine and who are still there. So it starts with this question of like kind of a little bit of a hopeless kind of remembering of the things that are not any longer there. And as I was, I, as I have thought, because, you know, I'm, I'm a critic too, so I write and then I kind of criticize my own book and think, no, I, this was missing and no, that was maybe not the way of saying that, etc. So in 10 years, I've done a lot of thinking and a lot of traveling to the same place. And I've tried to recover, think about the things that are gained as well within these losses, which is also something normal in life if you leave or are expelled or forced to leave. Anyway, so, so I really wanted to return to Arabic. I really wanted to not only uh, push aside a little bit of the presence of English, 
which is there, but not in a very difficult way, not in a very long way. It's not entire pages of English, not at all. And then sort of incur in the use of other languages here and there perhaps closer to what Juno Diaz does, that he chooses words or phrases that he knows that are close enough to English so that if somebody reads them, they will be able to figure it out somehow or, or will be able to figure it out by context without translation, without a parenthesis that says this word means this, right? But in context, in a very literary way. So I've worked that way through this book, which is mostly written in Spanish. But I did want to return to Arabic, written in Arabic. And that, of course, was one of the challenges, right? What do I do with the reader? Is the reader going to completely abandon if I just switch to Arabic, transliterated and then in the Arabic script? And so what I figured out was if I could return to the beginning of the text, I would be able to solve that problem. And so the text actually, the, the, the book finishes with a moment where I am in a reading in Cairo with my future editor of this book in Arabic. And she is reading Arabic and I am reading other languages. But we're reading what is the beginning of this book. So basically when you look at the text, even if you don't know what is being said, and there's iterations, right? Sometimes it's in Spanish, Portuguese, French, the same line, and then I move along. So there is a sort of complicity with a reader who will figure out, because the text tells the reader, that the book finishes as it starts. And therefore, the translation of that text is already included or pointed at in the beginning of the book. So I do not renounce communicability and I don't want to get my reader entirely lost but I do want to have that sort of reading as a sort of exposure to these other languages that are occurring around us so that's the way I thought about solving that question but you know any right any question about writing in other languages will require really thinking how to do this and that's what we do every day as writers It's a very simple question. Um, <clears throat> relating to what you said with uh, Lucia Berlin, I can't remember myself in English, all those things. I think we have a very mainstream conception now that you develop a new personality in language, the languages that you learn, no? Um, which in like polyglot uh, circles and like very shy people think, all right, I'll learn French because maybe in French I'll be a bit more charismatic. <laughs> I'm not projecting here, of course, um, but uh, I was wanted to know if you so think languages that... as alcohol. It will oh, just, you know, liberate me. Then no. <laughs> uh, the question is: Do you think we, like, when we learn a new language, that personality is like we're like inheriting? It's like an inherent personality from the language, or we're we're starting from scratch? You know, like building blocks from scratch. Will we become like little Germans or will we like from scratch build our personalities if we start to learn Japanese? What do you think? I love your question and I have no answer to it. I don't know. I really don't know. I, I don't think I'm a different person in English. I think I kind of more, mm, I am at a moment where I'm more comfortable with English, but I was actually not liberated by English, but made very self-aware of, uh, the difficulties of speaking in English or teaching in English, which was the hardest. So now I'm just now, after 20 years, becoming a little bit more comfortable. But I wouldn't say that English liberated my, you know, my shyness or anything of the sort, or that when I was learning uh, German, I was becoming more strict or more, you know. Actually, what is interesting is that I, you know, I I, I learned when I started uh, learning learning German because I was in in uh, Berlin for for a year um that i have the misconception of german being a very hard language you know and i and i realize that it's because we just watch films of nazis shouting and screaming and saying awful insults right to their enemies uh in in german films so many films about that that i had watched so i had this idea of a very harsh language and then when i actually was there i i thought oh it's actually a very lovely language 
full of diminutivos, like, like tender words, uh, as any other language, right? So, so this idea, I don't know, I, that, that's the only sort of deriva que se me ocurre. But I don't really know that languages will do something to you unless you really want to become a different person in a different language, I guess. No. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So maybe we need to learn Japanese or Chinese and see what happens. Yeah, or who we want to become uh, in that language. But not my case. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Lina. Uh, they would just tell me that she will be uh, happy to sign some books outside if you want to take a copy. And if you're not going to come here on the 31st, that we are going to present her book, uh, Palestina en Pedazos. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo a todos. Thanks a lot. And see you soon.